but since we have a somewhat limited amount of time, we, we can't go over his entire military experience. But um, he was in the 91st Bond Group, which is one of the first Bond Groups that went to England during World War II. He wasn't one of the originals, but you know the Memphis Bell, the movie? That was the 91st, that was his Bond Group. So when he went over there uh, at the end of 1943, that group had already established, you know, quite a reputation for flying bombing missions out of, out of England. And uh, one of the things I, I wanted to ask you was, when did you go in the military? Uh, going to the, air, uh, the Army in Friday, December 13, 1940. We were Four of us were out running around the country, and 19 years old, and trying to find trouble to get into. And they turned the corner down to Pittsburgh, Kansas, and here was a recruiting bus for the Army. And on the dare, we all four signed up. One didn't make it because of a dislocated hip, and one was lost in a, in a <clears throat> shell hole in Anzio, in Italy. Two of us finished the war. Uh, I made my last mission the 29th day of April, 1944. My sixth trip over to Berlin. And how many missions was that, your final mission? That was my final mission. I made my 30th one. They, uh, originally, they required, 20, after 25 missions, you were washed out, you were washed up. Lost your nerve, you, you just jump in those days. But uh, there's got to be a few guys finishing up, so they up to the 30 missions. And I was out right in the middle of my tour, so I made the 30. When you went overseas, uh, you told me earlier that you flew overseas. Could you just tell me a little bit about the route you took? <laughs> well, we. Uh, all of us green as could be. I had about 200 hours in the B-17, about 400 hours total flying time. My crew had a couple of hundred hours in their position, the navigator and all of them. Those days, it was celestial navigation. You had to shoot the stars and the moon and whatnot for uh, courses. And so I had a navigator do that because I didn't know that difference between the sun and the moon, but that's about as far as my astronomical knowledge is. But anyway, we picked up a new airplane just to ferry over there in New York, New Jersey. We went to Bangor, Maine, where we fueled up. Goose Bay, Labrador, where we fueled again. You didn't necessarily need fuel in all those stations. You had fuel, but the more you could take overseas, the less they had to ship over. So if we could take full tanks over there, that suited everybody. But after uh, Goose Bay Laboratory went to uh, Ricky Bay, Greenland, uh, Tule, Greenland, and then Ricky Bay, Iceland, and then in Prescott, uh, in England, where we surrendered our airplane. They took it on to to a base where they put it in combat the next day, probably. So we were a while getting to run over England and getting back assigned to the 91st Bomb Group. But I started flying missions in the first, early in December of 1943. Okay. <clears throat> One of the uh, missions that we discussed earlier that I think is a a really important one, a significant one in his history is uh, a mission that took place early in 1944 uh, where you were flying on the left wing of the, in the lead squadron uh, of that mission, which was your fifth mission. Can you tell us the date of that mission and then tell us what happened on that mission? We, uh it was the 11th day of January of 44, and they came in and 
two thirty in the morning or so and wake you up. But you had first of all you had to shave real careful because stubble in those old oxygen masks wasn't funny. Uh, then you had to uh, time for breakfast. Well, at two thirty to three o'clock in the morning, nobody enters too much for breakfast. And then you knew he was going to be in the airplane for about ten or twelve hours, so you didn't drink a lot of coffee or water. <coughs> because in those days there wasn't bathrooms on the airplanes. But anyway, you then went to the briefing and you found you're going up on the big board and run a string, a bright red flannel string out to the target and what towns you would go over, what checkpoints you'd go over on the way to making that trip. Uh, when we got off the ground, the ceiling was about knee high to a duck. It was almost, almost impossible to see anything outside of a little bit down the runway. So you immediately had more instruments, and I didn't have much instrument experience. Uh, but we made it anyway. We got 166 bombers off all over England and formed up over the base at 20,000 feet and headed for Germany. Well, the uh, weather deteriorated from there on. They said it was one P-47 took off and climbed up to 3,000 feet. He was still in the suit, though he spiraled back down and, and uh, they scrubbed everything. Uh, they called off all the rest of the bombers. But we were already well over the channel, maybe across to, across to Holland going in when we got the recall message. Well, it was kind of silly to turn around then. But we went on to the target, the 166 bombers, because we had no fighter escort. And it was up to us to fight the German dog between the anti aircraft fire and the German fighters. That's then that they estimated 500 German fighters up that day. But we lost 42 airplanes, that's only 25 percent. But the weather had improved enough that we could land when we got back. What fuel was it made it back? Otherwise, you, you landed any, any place you find a base where you could land. British base, a fighter base on landing mats. When you got back, you were glad to get it down anywhere. But we made it back to base that day. Was your plane uh, individually attacked by fighters that day? Well, you never knew. But they, they came into formation two, three, four, five at a time. So we, they were shooting at the formation more or less as, as opposed to an individual airplane, we thought, anyway. But then, on the other hand, you thought every one of them was pointing right straight at you. <laughs> you described uh, what it, what it uh, looked like to see a, a fighter coming head on. Could you describe that for the folks here today? Well, your, uh, your, your biggest asset to your defense was to give your gunners a solid, stable platform to shoot from. So the thing you tried to do was hold that airplane as still as possible. It wasn't very possible because you looked up and saw those lights, those guns on the wings of that airplane coming at you. It was pretty hard to sit still. Were the, were the attacks mostly head-on attacks then or were they coming from different directions? All of the attacks were head-on as far as I can tell. They, they, uh, when the Germans first started uh, trying to shoot down the B-17s, they come up from the rear. Well, uh, their, oh, their their speed was only about 100 miles an hour faster than we were, so that tail gunner on that 17 out there had an awful good target back there. So they, they changed their tactics real quick. So they come around to the front where they were holding in range of your gun for about 10 seconds. <coughs> Of course, on the other hand, you weren't, you weren't in their range either. Did, uh, did, did your group get recognized in any way for that particular mission? For that mission, we were recommended and awarded the 
presidential unit citation. Did you, did your entire crew survive that mission and survive the war? My entire crew finished the war, uh, finished our, our assigned 30 missions. Can you, uh, you told me that you went to a place called Berlin a few times. I made the first six daylight raids that we made on Berlin. I finished up over Berlin. Flew on Berlin the last three missions that I flew. Could you tell me uh, if, of all the different targets and like all the anti-aircraft and fighters, was there, would you consider Berlin to be the toughest or one of the toughest or were there others that were more significant in that way? Well, uh, Berlin was a big city. They had a lot of anti-aircraft guns. So that was spread over quite an area. Uh, it was just like flying into a cloud. The, the smoke from the anti-aircraft fire going up. There were never any fighters over Berlin because they, were, they didn't fly into their own anti-aircraft fire. But that was one of the toughest ones, yeah, because you were in that. They were shooting at you steadily with those 88 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. Steadily. That was the roughest one. It lasted so long. Could they, uh, well, what was the altitude that you flew at on most of your missions, and could the anti aircraft always reach you at the height you flew? Our, uh, we flew 28,000 feet most of the time. The uh, B 24s flew at about 25 or 26,000. They, they're the best operating altitudes. There. I, I won't tell this because uh, I tell a lot of stories nowadays, and some of them are even true. <laughs> so we kind of like to fly close to a group of B-24s. When the German fighters came up, they came to them first. So, uh, but the flak, the anti-aircraft, could always reach you no matter how high you flew? Their capability? We got to uh, 32,500 feet over there one time and the flight was going off above us yet, so I have no idea what their, what their, uh, where it would end. Some of the guys that flew jets over there, 40,000, might tell you, I don't know of it. So when you uh, finished them, did, did you lead any of the missions? as you became more senior over there in Europe? Were you, did you ever lead the formation on any of the missions? Well, I led our squadron a few times. It, you, you become a leader kind of a process of elimination. If you, had, you lasted longer than the rest of them, then you were the leader. <laughs> whether, you, whether you were qualified for it or not, you become the leader. What sort of uh, escorts, you mentioned uh, P-47s, was that uh, the kind of escorts you had during your tour there, and could they take you all the way to the target and back? Well, they worked, uh, they could get us all the way to the target and back, but it was in relays, because they didn't have the fuel capacity to go all the way to the target and back if they got in a fight. And the Germans learned pretty quick that they come up and harass the fighters as they come across the channel, and they'd have to drop their auxiliary fuel tanks, their big belly tanks, to, to defend themselves to fight them. So then they couldn't go on with us. Uh, but they come in relays. They would carry that big belly tank. They get all the way to the target with that. And then they could. Have, fight for a while and before they and still have fuel enough to get home. How many how on how many of the missions do you think that you were attacked by fighters? Well I don't ever remember one of my thirty that we were attacked by fighters, sometimes only for maybe one, two passes. Otherwise they'd go back that they had time to 
land and fuel up and get new ammunition and come back up and fight us again. So uh, I don't ever remember a time that, that, that we didn't have both a lot of anti-aircraft fire and a few fighters. Okay. Um, when you flew your final mission, were there any particular feelings you had that day knowing it was going to be your last one or any superstitions or any things that were in your mind that day you want to tell us about? Nothing, nothing specific. That was just another day. You got out of the airplane and sit down on the ramp and thank the good Lord you're still alive. Were there, I've heard some of the guys tell me that uh, there were different superstitions, you know. The one guy told me he carried a, a, sh a shamrock or something with him and that he wore a certain hat and that he would always start out with his right foot when he got into the plane and that he, and that he, uh, he was Catholic but he also uh, attended some Jewish worship there. He said he wanted to protect everything, you know, <laughs> have everything in his favor. Did you? Uh, did you know any guys that had any particular good luck charms or, or any rituals that they do? There's a oh. silver dollar. This is not the one I've got hit in my billfold I've carried around, but it was made in 1922. My wife gave it to me when we were married, and I was always in my pocket. I still carry it all the time. I'm not superstitious, no, but we didn't fly a 13th mission, we flew 12B. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell a little side story. Uh, my, my friend who was one of the originals in the, in the 91st that was shot down in 1942, and uh, he told me, he said, you know, there's all this stuff about fire escorts, and he said, uh, you know, it's a myth, he said, that we didn't have escorts early in the war. He said, he said we had escorts on every single mission. He said, what would happen was the Spitfires would take us across the channel, and then the Messerschmitts would pick us up and take us to the target, <laughs> and sometimes bring us home. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you were married before you went overseas? The day I graduated from cadet school, 29th day of April, 1943. My girlfriend in those days pinned my wings on, my silver wings, and put my gold bars on her shoulder. And then I put a ring on her finger that night. So that was an anniversary I still remember. <laughs> it, it must, uh, I, I, when I hear these stories of you know marriages before guys went overseas, I always you know have a special place uh, for the wives and for the mothers, because it, it's one thing uh, for a young guy to go to combat, and it's another thing for a wife or a mother or a loved one to not be able to do anything about that, but sit and worry the whole time. And I'm sure that happened within uh, your family, too. Well, I'm sure it did. We, I had my mother and father lived on a farm in those days, we listened to the radio, but we didn't have electricity, so we, we didn't... Uh, didn't run the radio all the time, it ran off a battery, and they got their news mainly from the newspaper, or I occasionally wrote a letter home, a censored letter. So uh, they got news that way. <coughs> but uh, it took about 10 days for a letter to get across. So that's the way we communicated, by letter mostly. Did, uh, or were any of those letters saved? Were any of those letters saved? Do you still have any of those letters? No, I don't think so. I have one out there that was written to me over there from my mother-in-law, but I don't think I have one. I have some birthday cards from my wife, but otherwise, I lost a lot of uh, stuff that I souvenirs and whatnot, uh, stored up in the attic in my dad's old house, and it burned. So I lost, lost a lot of history there. Okay. Um, 
I thought we could maybe open, if there's a few questions now, uh, again, there's a, we could go on for hours with his history, but we are limited in time, but if there's a few questions, and I wanted to, to mention, too, that he stayed in the Air Force Reserve after he became the Air Force and retired as a lieutenant colonel, and uh, that was in 1981, so you stayed in, gee, that had to, from 1940 to 81, that had to be 10 or 12 years. Yeah, well, totally, I was in 40 years. Yeah, pretty amazing. We had a question back here first. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, the Germans changed their uh, tactics from back to front. Did your original 909 have a chin turret on it, and did, wasn't that the, uh, the reason they put the chin turret on the, on the 17th? Yes, sir. The, the original 909 would pull up beside this one out here and you couldn't tell the difference. Everything about them is identical. And did it have a chin turret on it then? Yes, sir. all the G models had a chin turret. Did that lessen the frontal attacks? Beg your pardon, sir. Did that lessen the attacks from the front, from the, the chin turret? I, I think that was probably the reason they put the chin turret on them, because uh, there was always people coming around, well, occasionally people came around and were asking the, the crew members, the pilots and the crew members, what could be done to, to improve our chances, in other words. And we, everybody, some more guns that would fire straight forward. Okay. Uh, way in the back there, first. Uh, how much flak damage did the 909 get during the time that you were uh, flying it. And also, did you ever see a German jet, one of those ME-262s over Berlin? Uh, the, the, first, the first question is how much flak damage or how much damage did the original 909 have? I'm assuming that when you were on some of those missions where you flew the 909, that it did get a few hits. Is that correct? You rarely ever in fact, I don't ever remember making a mission where we didn't have some battle damage. Some of it was quite a bit, but other times you just had a few holes. Okay, and his other question was, did you uh, ever see any of the German jets, or was that after you were there? Uh, we saw a couple of airplanes one time, way up. We didn't know what they were, but we assumed there were a jet of some kind, because the jet engine was in, it had just been invented. Uh, we didn't have jet engines at all in those days. And that 262 was the first German airplane developed a jet engine. And they tell me they weren't very reliable because the, the uh, Germans wanted all their good uh, steel mill to uh, into their infantry or tanks and stuff. And they used inferior metals in the turbines on the jet engines so they weren't very reliable. Another question back here. Um, what was the uh, temperature inside the, uh, the aircraft at 28,000 uh, feet? Also, uh, what if any insulation uh, for clothing uh, assisted you in uh, staying warm? Okay. <clears throat> But the coldest I remember ever seeing it over Germany at 28,000 feet was 67 below zero. And uh, I never wore them, but the crew wore like long underwear, but uh, with electric wire in it, like electric blanket that ran off of the battery of the electrical system, so the crew could stay warm. But if you stuck your hand out of the window back there, bare hand out of the window, that thing you couldn't pull it back quick enough to avoid frostbite. It was that cold up there. But uh, myself, I didn't wear too many clothes because I got hot up there. I was working hard, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's pretty hard to find formation with hard work. With no assist on that thing, it's all manpower. And now you can imagine going down the interstate out here in your car, 90 miles an hour, and you try to keep your bumper even with the bumper from the car in the next lane. 
and see how, you know, forward and backward how hard that is and then and then going this way and you try to keep your wing dip even with the lead ship up here and the nose even at the tail of your airplane. Now I had up and down to that. So you're working pretty hard and you I've had my hand gloves freeze to the throttles. Did you switch off with the co pilot? You no, we didn't we didn't converse. I was he was uh, the uh, he talked to the crew all the time on the intercom. And I had to monitor their group frequency on the radio. So we didn't talk to one another. Did, uh, did he, did you switch flying, did he take over the controls to give you a break occasionally? Rarely, but yeah. Another question. How long was a mission? Well, I flew 30 missions. I have 249 hours and 50 minutes actually logged in the book, so roughly nine hours. It run anywhere from from uh, six hours up to eleven. What was the far the longest mission you flew? Was it past Berlin? Did you go east of Berlin? We went car into Poland, to Poznan, in Poland, which was eleven hours and twenty minute mission. After a ball bearing factory in Poznan. Uh, all German engines and most machines run on ball bearings. And uh, if we could tear up their ball bearing plants, then they might have engines built but didn't have bearings for it. That was one of our contributions. Uh, and beside that, the uh, fuel oil refineries, we like to tear them up. They made wonderful fires. <laughs> I've seen smoke from a oil refinery at 30,000 feet. Back. Uh, yes, uh, what type of German interceptors did you encounter and which did you find to be the most dangerous? Yeah, what German, did you hear that? What German planes did you encounter and which were the most dangerous in your opinion? Anything you were shooting at you was dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way we felt about it. It didn't make any difference. Eh? Anybody who's shooting at you is dangerous. <laughs> which kinds did you see out there, though? What, what German fighters? Well, I think they made more ME-109s than anything. <clears throat> but I like your comment that uh, anybody shooting at you wasn't a welcome sight. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, any final questions before we wrap it up? And he's here in case you, you know, that you have individual questions, too. But one more group question. Um, what is the typical size of the crew? How many members flew on a plane? Well, there were ten of us. We had four officers, a bombardier, a navigator, a pilot, and a co-pilot. Then we had six minor all staff sergeants. But, uh, if we were shot down, you wanted all your, your uh, enlisted men to be all, uh, ranked because uh, the German prisoners, German guards treated the prisoners, if they were uh, sergeants and above, they treated them a little better than they did the buck privates. So we want them all to be, have some stripes on their arm. I also heard that, that, that they were uh, exempt from being forced to work if they were sergeant or above or something like that per the Geneva Convention. I never uh, wasn't aware of that. Okay. Very possible. Well, I think we're going to end this uh, officially here, and, and uh, I think that we need to give uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hackleman here and, uh, some applause. Thank you.
places you had a long list also of training locations. Yeah. After Columbus, Ohio, then we went to Alexandria, Louisiana, where I got our crew together. Yeah. And then we, when I came back then, I was assigned down to Ardmore, Oklahoma. So, uh, yeah, I've been to a lot of Aside a lot of places. <laughs> what, what do you recall about the relationship between the military and the, and the aircraft manufacturers? Were people coming from the aircraft industry then into the military? Occasionally, somebody would come from the factory. One, uh, anything that we could tell them that they could do to the airplane, uh, that would improve our chances of survival. Like his, that's what my dad worked in Solid Hill, Baltimore. Maybe the other one. Yeah. And, and then in 43, he went into the military. And then he was the second most at that time. And they took ferry planes and stuff like that. Most of them. Yeah, he was right there. But they must have drafted him in so they could tell him exactly where they wanted. Yeah, they pretty well send you where they wanted you to, not where you wanted to go. Well, thank you for your story today. Telling me about some of these guys. <laughs> As I said, some of them are even true. <laughs> I, did you? Are you local from Minnesota, or did you come in here? I live in Springfield, Missouri. I drove up here yesterday. Okay. You still got good eyes. I'm wearing glasses, and you don't have glasses. I had a cataract surgery three or four years ago. This eye, 2020. That's no more that good. Sure oh, wow. that as well. <laughs> yeah, I just can't hear. Even even with a hearing aid, uh, you know that just makes things a little louder, but not loud enough to really understand everything. That's my problem. I hear the sound, but I can't understand it. They, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but they, yeah. Supposedly, a lot of hair stand up back there in the ears and wave back and forth and get certain sounds they send over to your brain. Most of those hairs are broken off because of the loud noise. Yeah. With those aircraft real noisy on the inside, they work. That's what they call it. Yeah. What would it, oh, to add to that, when that top turret over there turned that gun around and shoot right straight forward. The barrel was only about that far above your head. Oh, that was noisy. So that made your neck get pretty short. Yeah. <laughs> I've often wondered, what would it take to rip the wings off of that, that, that uh, B-17? If you're just flying straight and level, say you're at 11,000 feet, 11,000 feet, straight and level, full throttle, wide open, and you just pulled back, should start climbing, would it rip the wings off of it or not? It won't rip the wings off. Would it just go at an angle like that or how it would it? go up for a while if you're going full throttle. Okay. And then it would just stop. It would stop. It would stop. I could, well, I couldn't do it now probably, but no, I, at one time when I could get that airplane up to go like this, it would fall through and come up on the other side and come back up this way and get the, the airspeed absolutely zero. But the airplane's still running. Yeah, still running, yeah. Still, the engine's still turning, the prop's still turning. Four throttles. But it actually stopped. 
Yep. It is zero airspeed. Really? And it would not rip the wings off? No. I figured because it would jump like that, it would just you know, tear everything apart. I don't think you, that airplane really builds like a tank. I don't think you can rip the wings off of it, period. Really? So we got shot out of formation one time and just turned her straight down 400 miles an hour. You actually like that? Yeah. And you could pull it back out like that? You got it up to 400 miles an hour? Wow. That's amazing. That's fast. That's estimated because the... You went past the red line. <laughs> it got not only red line, but the peg around it. <laughs> so the engines would go above rated RPM then. If you're going straight down, the engines would go above the rated RPM, which was probably 2800 or RPM. Gosh, I don't know. I wouldn't... I wasn't worried about that then. <laughs> well, no, I, I, know, worried, but, yeah. I was worried about getting down right on the deck. So we, yeah. yeah. Was that in the Memphis Bell? Was that in the movie? Pardon? Well, where they were going straight down, was that in the movie? Where they were going down and they tried to pull it back out like that and it started to climb up like that, or maybe that's what it was in another movie. Well, we didn't want to climb back up. We wanted to stay right down on the deck. So you could follow the terrain down like that. The German air, aircraft, if they come after you, if you went down over the hill and he was looking in that bomb sight, I mean that gun sight, he might fly right into that hill. That's what we hoped would happen. I suppose some did, some didn't, I suppose. Yeah. 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 Wow. Who, who that, built, who, that, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Pardon? Who built the engines? Right Cyclone. Right Cyclone. So what was the difference between the B-29 engine and the B-17 engine then? Well, the uh, B-17 is only a nine, nine-cylinder. And then the B-29, somebody else built it, but it was an 18-cylinder engine. That's the difference. The same, same thing as a nine-cylinder engine, only put two of them together and had two banks of cylinders. Hmm. Wow, that's... Then the P-47 went in for the, they put four banks of cylinders together, or seven cylinders. So he had a 28-cylinder engine. Yeah, but you can't cool it. Well, they did. I've always thought they could only go two banks, because you, you would, you know, one bank here, one bank here, and they would stagger them so air could get across. They, and they built ducts to get cool air to those back engines. So, so it would duck it in then. I see. I didn't yeah. know you could do that. Well, they how did. many? How many? Oh, oh yeah, no. How many horses did that put out there? Four thousand. Four thousand. What was the B seventeen then? Twelve fifty per engine. Per, yeah, per engine. And the B twenty nine was. Oh, I can't tell you. Yeah. Uh, I mean. I, I can tell you, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is the cruising speed for a B-17? Yeah. Oh, around 160. So full. 165, 160, maybe. 165. So what's full throttle then, just wide open? <clears throat> Probably 220. Oh, 220. Probably, yeah. How long would it last at that speed? Would, would it eventually tear it apart? Or? Well, I run one of them uh, at 2550 and 50 inches manifold pressure for 20 minutes. That's uh, all we had. Mm -hmm. One engine. You were down to one engine? You were down to one engine? Wow. And about this high off the water, <laughs> coming across the <clears throat> English Channel. And it, one engine would pull that airplane. Did you throw everything out the airplane, all the weight and everything? To lighten it up. Mm. Yeah, we dumped everything you could throw out. Yeah. Or we dropped that ball to it if we could, but we couldn't. Yeah. So how did you land it? You had to get some altitude up to land it on the uh, on the runway in the target. Not on the beach, you didn't have to. Oh, you put it on the oh. <laughs> you, you, you couldn't climb with it. You know, I guess not. You just brought it in on the beach. Was it near the cliffs of Dover, or were it, was it a flat part of the? Was it near the cliffs of Dover, or was it on a flat, we flat were area? We around to the little way to the east. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be east around England. Yeah. Wow, that was a close call. 
So it was, it was an exciting day when we got home. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So you had to give it full rudder to the other side so it wouldn't side saddle them, in other words. You well, you kind of combination. You hold that dead wing up a little and then a lot of rudder to keep it. So you're going, actually going a little sideways. That would make sense because of the pole. Yeah, makes sense. We were fortunate there was an inboard engine. Now, I don't think you could do it on an outboard. <laughs> I don't think you could do it. Because it would yeah. have even more of that, it, it, yeah. yeah, that you'd have to overcome. And it, okay. yeah. What happened to the engines, or, or don't you know? They no, shot up? Shot up. They yeah. shot up. Okay. See, uh, uh, everybody watched, the top turret gunner always watched to see if there was oil coming out on top of the wing. The ball turret gunner down there watched to see if there was oil coming out of the bottom of it. So you had an indication if you were, one of them was shot out and pumping a lot of oil, to get it shut down before it caught fire. That's why they did that. Did you ever have any in, uh, close calls with flak or the bullets or anything? Being You were the target, I suppose, of the, most of the fighters being the pilot. Well, I had a couple of bullets come through the windshield. One of them went over my shoulder here, I don't know where it went, but the other one went between my arm and my body here. Holy cow, that's Jeez, close. That's close. Well, what happens when a windshield breaks? Is that... Uh... Well, it didn't break, it just made holes. Oh, it. okay. So uh, how thick were the windshields at? About two inches thick. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Oh, man. I've got... Got proof of that story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. That's the picture of the. Uh, oh, yeah. picture of it? Uh -huh. See, this back here is a helmet with goggles, but you always wore sunglasses because it, it's bright up there. Yeah. That you always wore uh, goggles on your helmet. So if that windshield did go out, you could pull those goggles down and the rest of your face was covered with the oxygen mask. So you didn't, wouldn't freeze your face in there. But uh, yeah, there's the bullet hole that went right through here, somewhere here. Mm -hmm. And this one up here went over my shoulder. That happened on the same day? Yeah, they're both the same, same time. Day. Yes, all the same time now. Okay. Yeah. Probably from the same gun, we never knew. <laughs> well, you're a lucky man to have survived that. Yes, sir. <laughs> the whole crew. Was there. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, the good Lord put us on this earth, but He didn't give us any guarantee. <laughs> He's trying to find a place for all of us. He just, some of us is hard to find a place for. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, well, thank you, sir. Appreciate your uh, coming and your Thanks a lot. Appreciate the story. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. A very interesting, you, outstanding brother. presentation. Yes. I enjoyed talking about it now. It's a long time I couldn't. Yeah. No, you, you see a, in a formation up there and your buddy sitting over yeah. here on this side and maybe another one down here. And yeah. All of a sudden, they poof, they're gone. It brings back a lot of memories. Yeah. yeah. I wake up fighting now and then at night. <laughs> yeah. And you still have nightmares from it. And yeah. That was 70 years ago, yeah. almost. Yeah. Well, this, it's the suddenness, too, of the shock of losing somebody that you know that quickly uh, with no real warning. You didn't really make close friends. Yeah. You had a lot of acquaintances, but no close friends. Yeah. Because tomorrow he might be gone. Do you still have anybody left from your crew that you keep in contact with? I don't think there's anybody left. You're the last? Yeah. The last I knew of them was Robert Zabotsky. He lived down in Ozark, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's Gary Hall, who's the editor of the Ragged or Regular, United Coast Bond Group yeah. uh, newsletter. Uh, he called me one day. I wanted a little more history on him. And, and, uh, 
He was the last one that I know of. And yeah. Part of them I knew were gone. Others we had no, never had any contact with. Yeah. Can I ask how old you are? What your age is? On May the 17th this year, I was 92. Ah. Congratulations. Yeah. I hope I make it that long. <laughs> <laughs> well, my philosophy. I was 20 when I started to work. I worked for 40 years. Now I want to be retired for 40. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Got 32 of it in. Excellent. <laughs> you got eight more to go, <laughs> at least. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you. Thanks again. Thank, thank you a lot.